Welcome to our Liberty Salon poetry reading in the Benton Building, downtown Aspen, Colorado. We've got a display of original silkscreen works of art by Benton that include his uh, favorite words by different poets that he was inspired by. And I'm going to read a brief uh, piece by Tom Benton, since this is uh, his building. It says, to me, the word is the strongest form of art. The graphics are just a vehicle to carry out the words. I would have liked to be a poet. Whenever I do a poster, I try to include a quote, because the words will live forever. So in that sort of spirit, we're going to have different people um, read different pieces of poetry that they uh, are inspired by. And so uh, I'm going to start out. And what I'd like different people to do is, as you uh, come up, just sit here. We can probably fit two people here. And then we'll just sort of do a round robin, and everyone can um, you know, take their time. Very informal. Uh, and uh, the idea is uh, to have fun. So I'll start uh, with the first poem. It's by Pablo Neruda. There is no insurmountable solitude. All paths lead to the same goal, to convey to others what we are. And we must pass through solitude and difficulty, isolation and silence, in order to reach forth to the enchanted place where we can dance our clumsy dance and sing our sorrowful song. But in this dance or in this song, there are fulfilled the most ancient rites of our conscience and the awareness of being human and of believing in a common destiny. So I'll get up and uh, feel free to come through uh, as you go along. If by Rudyard Kipling, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tr tired by waiting or be lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise, if you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again in your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve you your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. Or if you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friend can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiven minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and w which is more, you'll be a man, my son. This is a complex poem by Robinson Jeffers, and I was having to have really read it several times to really get it, otherwise those who know the poem would be realizing I'm misreading it. But we're all looking for the answer, and this is called The Answer. Then what is the answer? Not to be deluded by dreams, to know that great civilizations have broken down into violence and their tyrants come many times before. 
When open violence appears, to avoid it with honor or choose the least ugly faction, these evils are essential. To keep one's own integrity, be merciful and uncorrupted and not wish for evil and not be duped by dreams of universal justice or happiness. These dreams will not be fulfilled. To know this and know that however ugly the parts appear, the whole remains beautiful. A severed hand is an ugly thing, and man dissevered from the earth and stars and his history for contemplation or in fact, often appears atrociously ugly. Integrity is wholeness. The greatest beauty is organic wholeness, the wholeness of life and things, the divine beauty of the universe. Love that, not man apart from that or else you will share man's pitiful confusions or drown in despair when his days darken. So this is another Robinson Jeffers. It's called Return. A little too abstract a little too wise. It is time for us to kiss the earth again. It is time to let the leaves rain from the skies. Let the rich life run to the roots again. I will go to the lovely Sur rivers and dip my arms in them up to the shoulders. I will find my accounting where the alder leaf quivers in the ocean wind over the river boulders. I will touch things and things and no more thoughts that breed like mouthless mayflowers darkening the sky, the insect clouds that blind our passionate hawks so they cannot strike, hardly can fly. Things are the hawk's food and noble is the mountain. O oh, noble Pico Blanco, steep wave of marble. Robinson Jeffers. He was, he was a West Coast poet. I don't know how many of you know of him. But I, I, a book of his poetry came to me in the 60s. I never did read it. I think I will now, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a, a little brief interlude. Uh, Robinson Jeffers uh, and Benton had a lot in common, and uh, were both ardent environmentalists. And Jeffers had a house in Big Sur that he built out of stone that was called the Tor House. And Benton, as an architect, uh, recalled going there when he was young and um, looking at the house and, um, from the beach and learning about Jeffers' poetry. And uh, one of the things Jeffers is most famous for saying is, um, I'd rather kill a man than a hawk, uh, which is uh, really interesting. So, uh, Benton was so inspired by Jeffers that he used his poetry in a handful of Benton's uh, works, um, more than almost any other poet. So uh, just a little brief interlude. You want to go, Michael? Put you on the spot? Yes, I'm on the spot. Good God, I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's wonderful to be here. Um, uh, I knew Tom. I loved Tom. I was his guest here, like right here. And um, when I was a school teacher, I the he would call up and say, uh, "Mike, would you like to bring your kids?" over to my studio and, and we'll ma make silk screens. Funny, I always accepted. <laughs> and it was wonderful to watch what the kids did under his rather gruff tutelage, but, but very, very real. Um, well, I just forgot the poem I was going to read. Maybe I just said what I needed to say. So thank you for listening.
I feel like I'm at church in sacred space here. Um, this is a dream deferred by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it sink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it just explode? I'm going to read another fun one just to sort of uh, get people on the spirit and maybe Clancy you'll go next. All right. <clears throat> uh, back to Langston Hughes. He uh, actually uh, grew up down the street from me where I grew up in Lawrence, Kansas which is a really um, sp special connection. And um, the poem I'm going to read by him was, uh, it's a short poem, but it basically is, uh, I stay cool and dig all jive. That's the way I stay alive. My motto as I live and learn is dig and be dug in return. <laughs> <laughs> right here. So I am working on a book of poems that I've illustrated. Um, and I saw DJ had some Dr. Seuss and some. Silverstein and then obviously some Steden works, all those are great influences of mine, so this is, a, this is a great spot for this to come together. Um, I'd love to show you guys the illustrations, it's sort of far away. Um, I, will I will show them, you know, and then if you want to see them again later, I can, I can hand them around and maybe point them towards the camera or whatever. But the book is entitled, Sexes for Pussies. <laughs> So it's sort of a look at my whole uh, sexual history, romance, lust, love, whatever you want to call it. I'll steal that. Sorry. DJ, you've shrunk. Um, so it sort of goes through, it's, it's chronological. Um, I'll start off at the beginning. I'm not going to read the, the whole book by any means. Um, but we'll start with one. It's called Losing My Virginity in 24 Seconds, Basketball and Dead Dogs. <laughs> All right. The sun still came up. I tried to celebrate the score, but screwed the win when my brother questioned, did you wear a hat? Nah, but I pulled out. I said it like I meant to do that. Oh. He shifted fourth to fifth in doubt and shook his head, half laughing something about hoping she's clean. I had no answer. Yeah, shit, maybe, I mean. My guts pulled down my ribs as though I'd run over a dog and didn't want to look back at it. I tried to jam it in but couldn't coordinate that after all the beers and the fact that I'd never dunked before. She alley-ooped me. I was told she was a whore. After years riding my own bench, after hours of flaccid dry pumping, after I pissed, after pick and roll humping, and another hour of her sucking my dick, the 24 seconds finally ticked. Oh, here's the picture. I have more, but I'll let other people go, and then maybe uh, come back. And we have Willie in the background with his lovely laugh. <laughs> so this is about skiing. We live in a ski town. And Sorry to say I never really got to hang out with Mr. Benton, but this building is really a sacred place, and this is a beautiful gathering. Thank you for all coming. So this was a cold day on the chairlift. Mesmerized by sunlight, shining through snow crystals, the sky and earth connected by water frozen 
perfectly preserved in 10 degree temperature. Hypnotized, eyes purely still as water vapor turns to crystal. On the lift, black ski pants reveal the crystalline structure of each flake. With a friend, we commune with the creation and consciousness crystallizes in our eyes and wells as the flakes, how creation loves every detail. A kind of caring worship, a church without walls, but windows of wonder and wonder worship until the seer and the seeing are one, the beginning and the begun never done. The friend's face, a crystal reflected in each other's eyes, hard to lift the body out of the chair with the senses swirling with the weightlessness of wonder. Sun dogs so cold, the snow doesn't fall, but floats. <clears throat> extremely well prepared. I had to look this up on my iPhone, but um, it's a Mexican poet, and his name is Nicanor Para. The true problem of philosophy is who does the dishes. Nothing otherworldly, God, the truth, the passage of time, absolutely. But first, who does the dishes? Whoever wants to do them, go ahead. See you later, alligator, and we're right back to being enemies. <laughs> This is a uh, local political poem. Uh, it's anonymous, but it had to do with uh, some people getting arrested in the valley here and the nature of things. So this is titled, The Rio Noblo. <laughs> <clears throat> On the banks of the Rio Noblo, my sweetheart and I wait for some spick or Russian mobster to put shit on the plate. No. Surely it is safer now with five old men in jail who will sell their souls and friends and town for geriatric tail. Or one less year in jail. I know he'll be expensive, the guy who fills the void, and cut it hard to make his cash. We really are annoyed. Because now we go down valley, where pigs and dope abound, and find the price is better all year round. On the banks of the Rio Noblo, we only had to stroll to better grass and coke and stuff over another knoll, and bring it back to all our friends at prices they'll afford, and tell the feds and local pigs get hungry, hot, or bored. <laughs> this is uh, part of my, my artistic, you know, uh, cowboy, hippie poetry. I wrote this when I was, uh, this poem's called Silent Echoes. And I wrote this when I was 19 years old. It was the first poem I ever wrote. And uh, it says, Come sit quietly, Echo, sweet child of mine, and watch the river of passion flowing through forests of fashion and mime. And come listen to those songbirds of beauty, but all at the dawn of reality glow. For you are the princess of the sunrise echo. Yes, only as a child should know. And come step carefully, Echo, ah, upon the grasses of greener shores, and uplift your laughter to the wings of the wind upon the babbling brook who snores. But let you be aware, sweet Echo, ooh, never crossing twice. For he snores with age and roars with rage and lives for sugar and spice. But with the sweetest of sympathy, Echo, 
Ah, sweet child of time, may your dreams be as sands in the hourglass, but in aging wisdom, your grapes become wine. And may your beauty inspire as a rainbow, and your innocence shine like a star. But most importantly of all, sweet echo, only just be who you are. So come watch carefully, Echo, lost child of the world, and watch that river of passion flowing through the forest where dreams are hurled, and leave the babbling to the brook in the forest as a lesson in fine fantasy. Yes, from princess of the sunrise, you become the queen of the sunset, truly innocent, wild, and free. Silent echoes. It's making me teary. Yeah. All right, I have funny and I have serious. But I decided funny. <clears throat> Messy Room by Shel Silverstein. Whosoever room this is should be ashamed. His underwear is hanging on the lamp. His raincoat is there in the overstuffed chair. And the chair has become quite murky and damp. And the chair, oh, pardon me, his workbook is wedged in the window. His sweater's been thrown on the floor. His scarf and one ski are beneath the TV, and his pants have been carelessly hung on the door. His books are all jammed in the closet. His vest and has been left in the hall. A lizard named Ed is asleep in his bed, and his smelly old sock has been stuck to the wall. Whose ever room this is should be ashamed. Donald or Robert or Willie or... Huh? You say it's mine? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I knew it looked familiar. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, these are the lyrics from a song called Amazing Grace by um, this guy named George Watsky. He's a young kid from California who was discovered um, actually in a slam poetry jam. And so now he dabbles between poetry and rap. So this is Amazing Grace. I used to think I was a Marxist. Now I go to less marches. It's not that I don't want to start shit, but I don't want to start shit unless it's where my heart sits. I don't keep a knife under my seat to join the revolution and spill blood in the street. Rather have a discussion over a bottle of blood or a puff on a blunt and then get something to eat. I used to have strangers if they believed in God to see if we were peas in a pod. And if they didn't agree with me, then I'd argue and try to be smarter, thinking I heard people applaud. But I'm getting older and I'm getting dumber, or at least I know less than I did when I was younger. I used to profess, now I'm more, f now I'm more pro wonder. I used to fear death, now I'm set to go under. No, fuck it, I still fear. This life is too top tier, and it's like we just got here. We're more than an Uzi on a Navy plane, or Lazy Susan cruising on the gravy train. We're the tingle up your neck when you see the sunset filter through the dust as it settles on the waves of grain. Yes, the waves of grain on the stolen land. Theft is as American as a cola can. Yeah, it was sold to Sam. Tell it to the mother of the little girl on the trail of tears as she holds her hand. Damn it, this was built on something ugly. But with all my heart, man, I believe in this country, the beauty of our Constitution. Have you read it lately? I swear it's really pretty lovely. It's really splendid. It's like our forefathers penned it, inspired by some early Eminem shit. It's like, the <laughs> it, it's like they meant it. It's like they dreamt that all the fences that divide us would eventually be mended, or rather torn down. So I don't think it's un-American at all for us to ask for even more now. Let's talk it over over more rounds. What do you say? <laughs> this just seems apropos, so I'll go again. Okay. Uh, Let America Be America Again by Langston Hughes. Let America be America again. 
Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be the great strong land of love, where never kings connive, nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope tangled in that ancient, endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the mend, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today despite the dream, beaten yet today, oh pioneers. I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamed our basic dream. In the old world, while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true, that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone, in every furrowed turn that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland shores and Poland's plain and England's grassy lay and torn from black Africa's strand I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today. The millions shot down when we strike. The millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamed, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay, except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again, Sure, call me an ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain from those who live like leeches on the people's lives. We must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states, and make America again. That is by Langston Hughes in honor of um, Black History Month. Let America be America again. <laughs> A 
lot of the pieces that I connect with um, have doves on them um, of Benton's. It was a symbol of life to him and has a deeper connection to doves and ravens to me. Um, and I feel as a community in the mountains, we all have a special connection with ravens. And um, this is a poem called The Raven Song by Miss Bonnie Payne. <coughs> if I was a raven, I'd fly out to the heavens. I'd fly to all my loved ones if I was a raven. If memory is worth saving, I'd savor the feeling of knowing love and loving. I'd remember the feeling. Some say up on that mountain, there is many a raven. They call out to the living from somewhere far beyond them, from those we love that have flown on, from those we love that have flown on. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. Thank you, DJ, for putting this together. Wow, what a great community we have here and what a beautiful space we have to celebrate it in. And um, thank you all so much for coming tonight. This isn't a closing, I'm just saying thank you. Yeah, we definitely do. I just wanted to say thank you. So for Tom, can you hear me? I couldn't hear it when the last woman, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, Tom was a friend and um, for about 25 years and I was a younger artist than him. And I'm very happy to say that every time, especially in the early years when it was harder for me to go to his studio, Every time I went to his studio, if he was home, 100% of the time, he always invited me in. He never once said, I don't have time for you, or this isn't good, not once. And I loved being with him, and he taught me a lot about following your own path, and I miss him. So um, I'm from New England. I've lived in Aspen about 35 years, and I'm headed back to New England. And I'm going to read something by Robert Frost. And you know, academia has a way of telling us that people are who they are not. And Robert Frost was not an old guy that lived in New England and wrote classic poetry. He was an amazing man. I've read some interviews that he gave. He was very gutsy, and he walked the land. And he lived on the land, and he loved the land, and he loved people. I don't know how he did it, because I'm having one of those days where it's really hard. So I'm really glad to be here. And I'm going to read something that we think, a lot of us think we've heard, but um, I'm going to ask you to try to hear it for the first time tonight. It's called The Road Not Taken. And, um, Hunter was a friend, and he took his own road. He certainly took the one that was left tra less traveled, and so did Tom, and so does JD, and so do most of the people in this room that I know. So this is for all of us. Remember, he was not an old no. New Englander, and this is not a classic. Maxie, can you chill? The road not taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I marked the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, 
I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Hey, so it's a great honor and privilege for this dude here to be here from South Africa, born in England. And uh, Connie over there brought me to this town almost 10 years ago, and I'm really, really, really starting to love this place. Took me a while. You know, it seems so shishy and <laughs> so one percent, and I was like, fuck this place, you know? <laughs> Get me down to Carbondale. The minute I discovered Carbondale, yeah. So these are three very, very short pieces, one for the planet, one is a love song to one of your former presidents, and one's for the indigenous. And on the one for the president, I'm going to request some feedback in the form of repeating the lines loudly, because it started out as a reggae song. You don't have to sing it, but yelling it is, would be great. <laughs> First one is called, it's about procrastination. It's about fixing the environment, it's about global warming, it's about climate change, it's about shit, doesn't even, it's not even real. It's called manana. Anybody know what that means? <laughs> <laughs> you might recognize the word in the English language. It starts like this. Too many sorrows, too many old wives' tales, too many tomorrows, not enough whales, that's that one. The next one, um, any uh, Democrats here? Yes. <laughs> cool. Are we on? Good. This one's <laughs> called Inside Ronald, and it's a love song to a certain former president, <laughs> beloved of us all. And if you would just repeat the line, I'll try to be as clear as I can so you can yell it back at me, all right? Please yell it at me, like be really pissed off. Do you mind? <laughs> cool. <laughs> all right. Inside Ronald. Inside Ronald. Reagan's head. Reagan's head. Turgid, muttering, slothful dread. Turgid, muttering, slothful dread. Across the land it spread and spread. Across the land it spread and spread. Arms manufacturers got to make more bread. Arms Pity that leaves the rest of us dead. Pity that leaves the rest of us dead. Inside Ronald. Inside Ronald. Reagan's head. Reagan's head. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've been wanting to do that one that way for a long time. This is the first. That was an intergalactic debut. <laughs> Connie, where's the book, darling? Because the third one I don't, um, I, I should know by heart, but I don't. So we get to wave our new book around, which has a, one poem in this book. The rest of it's... Thank you, Del. There it is. This one is called I Am Indigenous. And you don't have to yell. But you can if you like. Can we whisper? You can definitely whisper. Uh-huh. Thank you. This is on your book, The Trust Frequency. Yay. Published three days ago? Mm. Something like that. Flowers, flowers. Oh, well, thank you. Yay. Wow, talk about a plug, you know. Local bis support, local business. <laughs> All right, wrote this down in, wrote this down in a, a part of the planet that I really love, the American Southwest, which I, I'm a surfer, and I was always somewhere with on the ocean. And Connie brought me to Aspen, and then we started exploring Monument Valley and, you know, the, the Red Rock country. So this is called, I am indigenous. I am indigenous. 
under painted skies in a painted desert. I am indigenous. I live in any one of a hundred million eternal universes. I appear and I ponder. I live on that little planet way over yonder. I am indigenous under painted skies in a painted desert. I am indigenous. Thank you. Karen? You drive the car in. Car in. Car. Explore bookstore. Never explore. <laughs> Karen. Karen Jorgensen. Thank you. I've never done a poetry reading before, so this is the first. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> I Carry Your Heart With Me by E.E. E. Cummings. I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I am never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear. And whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. I fear no fate, for you are my fate, my sweet. I want no world, for beautiful you are my world, my true. And it's you are whatever a moon has always meant, and whatever a sun will always sing is you. Here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than the soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry your heart. I carry it in my heart. <laughs> Jeez. How do you so follow E.E. E. Cummings? My oh. God. <laughs> uh, I lost the poem. I lost the poem. <laughs> so everyone, deep, deep breath. We are a tribe here. The tribe that survives. I like that one. <laughs> uh, where did it go? Make it up. Oh, I like that one, though. <laughs> the silence. I hate when this happens. Vivid colors of elephant head, sunflower, columbine, through the eye, deep into, vivid, stored in the brain to feed in a world of white called winter. It's all about improv, making it up as you go along. I got like hundreds of pages of it, and I'm trying to put it together. You know, this town means a lot uh, to me, and I guess all of us. Um, it's kind of a weird vortex. Um, I met Hunter Thompson um, a while back, and we had a, a couple of spirited arguments over the course of about 10 years. Um, he said, you read it. I'm not going to write that. I'm a journalist. I deal with facts. So, kind of science fiction poems. And uh, never really put it all together and sat in front of anybody. Uh, really, till now. 
So I got a poem. Uh, it's not by me, Oscar Wilde. And uh, I'll read it to my wife who's sitting in the back there and to all of you. And uh, hopefully this helps me uh, pull it all together um, and, and get that stuff out of there. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I'm not going to write that. You write it. Um, to my wife with a copy of my poems. This is by Oscar Wilde. I can write no stately poem as a prelude to my lay. From a poet to a poem, I would dare to say, for if these fallen petals, one to you seem fair, love will waft it till it settles on your hair. And when wind and winter harden all the loveless land, it will whisper of the garden. You will understand. That's it. Bueno. So I actually was strolling around looking at the poems earlier and the one that he just read was kind of calling to me but it was I was a little nervous to read and I didn't pick it up I thought well if it's still sitting there later maybe I'll grab it and read it and then I went back and it was gone and I was like oh, a little disappointed I was like oh, I think I kind of wanted to read something and so then I walked over here and I found something that related to my time here as well so this is A Dream Within a Dream by Edgar Allan Poe. <clears throat> Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream. Yet if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep. Oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? Oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream. You'll all recognize this. It's our John Denver, the eagle and the hawk. So anybody wanna, who knows it can... <laughs> so join in if you know the words. I am the eagle. I live in high country, in rocky cathedrals that reach to the sky. I am the hawk, and there's blood on my feathers. But time is still turning. They soon will be dry. And all of those who see me, all who believe in me, Share in the freedom I feel when I fly. Come dance with the west wind and touch on the mountaintops. Sail o'er the canyons and up to the stars. And reach for the heavens and hope for the future. And all that we can be and not what we are. So I would say that that uh, relates a little, since this is the eagle and it relates little to the the America and what it can be and not what it is. Thank you. Um, I found this over there and it appeared magically and I got really excited because this is one of my favorite poems. But I've never read the whole thing, so bear with me. 
um, it's called Do Not Go Gentle into that, dead, into that Good Night by Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle in that, into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end, no dark is right. Because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see the blinding sight. Blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on that sad height, curse, bless me you now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle in that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So cool. Yeah, one more here. A uh, quick backstory for the for those who don't know, uh, Alfred A. Knopf was a, one of the original like publishing giants in New York, and then he got bought out by, I think, Scheinman and, and Schuster, one of, the, one of the major six. And I went to college with his granddaughter. <laughs> this is called Fucking Enough. <laughs> <laughs> Will's not allowed to laugh. It's, I won't be able to do this. All right, uh, nothing's changed. Here I stand in a similar cold shadow, looking to get published. And there I was then, looking to get laid. I look back enticed, keeping with familiar poems at the chances I missed that night. One slut, two slut, red slut, new slut. <laughs> Teddy Geisel always had it right. <laughs> So look, as we're getting close to closing, I think we'd better have uh, really short poems. Those short, three short ones I did before, yeah, I wrote those. But this one's written either, I'm pretty sure it's Ogden Nash, but it might be E.E. E. Cummings, and please correct me because I love this one. It goes like this. Here comes the whoppity, hippity, hoppity. Yeah. You know that one? <laughs> Now, there's an even shorter poem written by a uh, kind of sexy friend of mine out west who used to hang out of this nudist colony in Topanga when I first got to this country. And she wrote what I believe to be the shortest rhyming poem ever. Her name's Gloria Harmon. Connie, you know her daughter, Holly. And it goes like this. Skunk. Stunk. <laughs> the city zoo, a place where the wildness is kept, where I do not go, for I am not adept. I am a woman of proper ways. I do not sweat. I am in a daze. But something <laughs> called me through that day, a lonely cry, just a step away. Perhaps I could in some small, itsy-bitsy, tiny fashion assist the tiger. way was clear. A pond of water quenched my fear. As I approached the laughing lake, I felt the motions of a quake. Under my feet a mighty tumble that could cause a fuss, perhaps even a rumble. Twas it God or some almighty force that leapt and bounded here. Bulbous butt 
of a tremendous beast did rise amongst the waves <laughs> like a captain's feast. And I swear it is true that the mighty seas did part and let loose on this our good green earth a hippo fart. <laughs> oh, oh, the odorous waste, the horrific taste, the pungent smell did linger and dwell like the battlefields Gunga Din knew well. With no recourse but the deepest despair, I fell to my knees for fear the beast would sneeze. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> now, if my dear capable Henry had been there, I'm sure he would have cleared the air. But I, in my delicate state, could only gasp and swoon and faint. But alas, he has passed, so I must call up. Thank you, Hunter. Thank you, Tom. I must call up the strength within, for I am not a pup. Quickly, quickly, I leapt from the space without a track, without a trace. And though it was the ugliest of deeds, I must admit it birthed a seed of something very deep indeed. And so I think I shall never part with my memory of that hippo fart. <laughs> <laughs> for coming uh, to the Liberty Salon Poetry Reading, and I uh, thank Grassroots TV for all their great work, and uh, I really appreciate you guys coming together and um, doing something special here, so uh, thank you. And, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this reading with uh, one last poem, which sort of um, set up this whole thing with the Ben book and the gallery and everything. And it all goes back to one of Benton's posters, the Korea, Vietnam, Iraq poster. And that's the first poster I ever saw. And that inspired me to want to learn more and eventually write the book and do everything. But all that was reduced down to uh, seeing that poster, the Korea, Vietnam, Iraq. I reduced it um, to this poem that Benton was very fond of. and um, and. It goes uh, like this, it says, I saw a white bird once on a wild coast and fell in love with this dream which obsesses me. So um, with that, uh, I wanna wish you good night. Thank you. Yeah.